Hi guys, and welcome to Specimens. My name is Elle, and I am the host of this podcast where I speak with the stewards of conservation about the species that live or once lived on this planet and how we can continue to preserve them and protect them. On today's episode, I speak with evolutionary biologist, primatologist, and broadcaster, Ben Garrett. I'm so looking forward to sharing my conversation with Ben with you all. However, I just want to say that at the end of every episode, some of you might have switched off by then, but I do run through all of the links on where to find the guest, including all of their social media handles and links to some of the things that they talk about in the conversation. So definitely check that out and order their books, follow their platforms, and be sure to tell people in your life about these episodes. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Ben, I'm so thrilled to be speaking to you for my podcast. You're a very busy man, so I'm so pleased you've given up your time to speak with me. How are you doing, and where are you at the moment? Uh, I'm not too bad, thank you. I'm currently sat in my uh, kitchen, looking out the window, and it's a beautiful sunny day, and I've got a little bit of time between my my crazy, hectic (laughs) schedule, as you say, so I'm really looking forward to chatting today. Well, I just let all the listeners know that actually prior to this conversation, you've already, I mean, it's still early in the morning and you've already spoken on a science segment on the radio. So you really are, you're not joking when you say you're a busy man. So thank you. (laughs) Right, let's get into it. So I'm not sure if you've listened to any of the episodes of the podcast, but the very first place that I like to begin with my guests is to go right back and to find out a little bit about you as a child and kind of where you started and where the love for the natural world came in. So tell me a little bit about where you grew up and did this environment impact, you know, your love? of the natural world. So I grew up in Norfolk on the east coast of the UK and it was a a rural community, um, a bit of a seaside town and it's one of the most deprived areas in the UK. So growing up in that respect there was no aspiration to go to university or or any sort of higher education actually. Um, But on the flip side my family, my mum, dad and and wider family um, all worked in the uh, the the not quite sure how to call it, the sector where there are pubs and clubs and nightclubs and restaurants. And so <laughs> granny owns a hotel and still does. She's in her mid nineties. Yeah. Mum and dad ran and owned oh. pubs. So I grew up in that sort of environment surrounded by people all the time, but it also meant mum and dad were very busy. So I spent a lot of time with my maternal grandparents and especially my granddad. And we were almost daily on the beaches, um, exploring, looking for stuff. <laughs> and it was this wonderful sense of exploring that local habitat that changed on a not a daily basis but an hourly basis but at the same time he didn't have that technical biology based knowledge to explain everything so instead we made up stories about the animals we found and the bits and bobs and the and the shells and the body parts and it was that sense of exploring the natural world and telling stories at a very young age that I think really threw me into that now jumping forward a little bit when I was about nine or ten um, in the same pub growing up um, in uh, that same area, um, we had an art lecturer who used to come in and as a, as, a, as a regular and he would bring in skulls for me to draw and, and every Sunday morning I'd go down into the pub and it sounds completely incongruous now but I'd go down into the pub <laughs> with my sort of PJs on and draw these bones and skulls <laughs> and pieces of fruit and one day he brought this skull in that really sort of... Uh, catalyzed my love for anatomy and and sort of biology and in that sense and a few weeks later he brought a dead gull into the pub with two stanley knives and unbelievably we dissected a gull on a pub table um as a 10 year old and that really really crystallized my love of of, of, of nature of anatomy and obviously shared links with you there with that that sort of the form and function mm. of, of of wildlife as well Oh, yeah, you're totally talking my language. I'm sure there'll be people listening thinking, how horrific. But I have to say, it sounds like the stuff of dreams <laughs> for, the t- for the young child in me. Anyway, you did talk a little bit about storytelling that's kind of been influenced by your grandparents. And I feel as though from the research that I've done, that essence of storytelling has very much kind of been perpetual in the work that you've then gone on to do. So it was really lovely to hear that you had that kind of formative experience, having that trickle down. And you said that you didn't have the biological, the science knowledge to back that up. So at what point did you shift from this kind of beautiful, whimsical projection of the world into something a little bit more concrete and a little bit more factual? 
academically, was it? Yeah, I guess. I always think it was later than it was, but um, mum and dad mm-hmm. moved house a couple of years ago and both retired, and I we found some of these old books that I had as a kid, some of the exercise books from, from the early <laughs> 80s, mid-80s, and um, even at about six, seven years old, I, want, I couldn't make my mind up, apparently, between being a marine biologist and a forensic pathologist mm-hmm. as a six or seven-year-old, so that... That sense of um, I definitely wanted to get my hands dirty um, came at a very early age, and I don't know. I, I don't actually know where the academic side came from. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember deciding I wanted to be a medical doctor as a kid, and I definitely want to be a pathologist, uh, and that stayed with me for a good decade, fifteen years almost. Mm-hmm. And I did lots of work experience in hospitals, and, and luckily worked in a mortuary and a funeral mm-hmm. parlor, and it was for me where I wanted to go. But there's always this sense of nature was a sideline. And then it mm. kind of hit me that uh, I didn't, for me at least, didn't want to spend my life working in a white room with white walls, ceilings and floors. Mm. However interesting the, the, the content in front of me, it was being outside, exploring and, and, and being amongst nature and, and wildlife that really threw me. But exactly where that came from, I don't know. But I, I decided to follow that path of... of of academia in terms of my, my degrees and, and my, my teaching sense. Yeah, so, so Ben, if you wouldn't mind telling me a little bit more uh, factually, what was your academic journey? Just because I know from my experience talking to people on this podcast that, that their route into science, it was never linear. It's always been that it's been influenced by lots of different aspects, lots of different um, experience that they've had that then draw them back into science at a later stage. So did you did you pursue anything like marine biology or evolutionary biology during your academia? Um, right. So whistle stop tour. I my I couldn't decide. So after deciding at least um, during my A-levels that I didn't want to be a medic, I had a bit of yeah. a sort of crisis of conscience, thought, my God, what do I do now? I, I have no idea. And I didn't know the opportunities were there that we, we know about now in terms of being a zoologist or a bioanthropologist or an evolutionary biologist. It, it almost sounds second nature. And even young kids know these opportunities are there now. I didn't know that back in the early 90s, I guess, uh, or mid 90s. And I knew that I wanted to go and be among nature, and it sounds such a cliche thing to say. So I did a, I did a gap year before before it was a thing. Um, so we didn't have to say gap year, um, but it was a gap year, and I wanted to go out and explore and see which part of the, the natural world that really hooked me. And I knew it was primates, so uh-huh, apes uh-huh. and monkeys and, and their relatives, the prosimians, like lemurs and, and tarsiers, for example. And for me, I'd always wanted to go to this one place. It was Madagascar. So I decided after my A levels, I hadn't sort of hadn't turned up to a university yet. I hadn't signed into anything. I didn't know where I wanted to go. This was my opportunity to go. Do I need to go to university? Do I not need to go? Which mm. one do I go to? From that linear idea of medicine, 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 to suddenly mm. the world is my oyster. Um, I thought I need some. I need some downtime to go and explore this myself. Um, and I, yeah, I went to Madagascar and spent the best part of a year out there working on a, a conservation project. Um, it's a marine conservation project. Absolutely loved what I did. There was lots of shark research, lots of lemur uh, <laughs> conservation, lots of community engagement, which is amazing. Um, then decided to go to mainland Africa and I planned to spend the best part of a year out there. I was on a roll and I think I lasted three weeks before I caught cerebral malaria and had to fly back home and it really <laughs> no. knocked me quite literally um, nearly finished me off at, at a very early stage but it had it was enough to whet my appetite and I thought right you know what I'm gonna go to university I completely love this I adore this this sort of world that I've had a taste of but again I didn't know which area of, of biology to go to and I did the whole rounds of different universities and saw the academics and one uh, one place completely inspired me and it was two academics it was Toby Carter and Philip Pugh from Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge, um, who were teaching and running, or partly running, this animal behaviour um, undergrad degree. And the way they spoke, the, the opportunities they talked about, and this sense of your first degree, at least, is very much a stepping stone onto bigger and better things. Um, and that was it for me. I didn't even go and see any other universities. It was, I completely adored the topic. I adored the, the people who taught on the on the course. So I did my first degree um, in animal behavior. I then very luckily um, found a few opportunities along the way. So I spent some time in Scotland working with deer and darting deer for a project and knocking them down to do genetic testing and to look at population dynamics. I also did a a fish-based dissertation looking at a weekly electric fish and their behavior. So it was really eclectic, really sort of an all-you-can-eat buffet in terms of looking around (laughs) the natural world and exploring it. Um, 
But I decided that that was it. I still wanted to get get muddy feet and, and disappear into the world, big wide world, and didn't quite know how to. And then, luckily, throughout my degree, I worked um, as a silver service waiter at the the inverted commas other university in Cambridge, the uh, the big one. <laughs> and um, was a I, I worked two or three nights a week as a, as a part time job in one of the colleges. Very posh, um, not really my thing at the time, but I thought it'll do. It was good mm. money. Uh, and they fed me, which was nice. So I am um, in my third year, though. I met Jane Goodall, Dr. Jane Goodall, who is and um, has been for for decades a leading primatologist and, and an amazing scientist, uh, very inspirational. Um, she was at one of the dinners, and I very luckily was serving her soup at uh, the top table. Um, long story <laughs> short, managed to sweet talk her into giving me a job after I finished my degree, and just a few months later, um, ended up in Western or well, Northwest Uganda. Um, on my own, running a massive chimpanzee conservation project, um, <laughs> habituating wild chimps, running ecotourism efforts and community engagement and law enforcement um, programs with a, an amazing bunch of uh, Ugandan field assistants and, and guides and spent the next several years uh, out there doing that and absolutely loved it. Um, but it was during that time that it kind of crystallised for me that I wanted to carry on my academic route. And at the time, I really wanted to be... <sighs> A proper, and again inverted commas, a proper academic mm-hmm. who had mm-hmm. had a, a research group and had labs all around the world and projects here, there, and everywhere. So I decided to come back. Um, I did spend a little bit of time in Indonesia working with orangutans as well, um, which was amazing. Um, and then did my second degree, my my masters at the Royal Veterinary College in London and ZSL, so Zoological Society of London, um, and did wild animal biology, which was much more anatomy based it was a, 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 i described that as a veterinary sort of veterinary biology degree uh, which was amazing and we did postmortems we looked at epidemiology and immunology um, management sort of population dynamics and management that was great um, and it was during that time um, i was out in the caribbean doing my dissertation looking for ironically looking for an extinct rodent which I didn't find because it was extinct. We already knew it was extinct, but it was um, it was a bit of a weird one. That anyway, um, it just goes to show you can find funding for the most bes- obscure and random things sometimes. Um, <laughs> um, and it was during that time that I, I whilst out there, um, saw monkeys that I'd seen in Africa, but they looked so very different to anything I'd seen in Africa. It was it was like they'd been stretched out and filled in, and they were like comparing you or I to the biggest bodybuilders you could imagine. Mm-hmm. but saying they're exactly the same thing and there's nothing nothing is meant to be different between the two well for me it was well this is just like darwin's finches and the galapagos this island speciation but actually we've got a record of these monkeys that were taken from africa to the caribbean with the enslaved africans sadly um, across that whole several hundred year period and they were dumped over there as uh, as pets for for rich uh, europeans who very quickly realized they weren't good pets primates never make pets make make good pets um <laughs> Yeah. And instead, they'd become a feral population across three islands, which had seemed to have gone on their own evolutionary trajectory in the last several hundred years. And it was this opportunity thinking, we've got the same thing, well, potentially the same sort of thing with the finches, but we've got this set of known parameters. We know how many were taken across. We know when they were taken across. We even know when, where they were taken from. So we can really start to explore what impact islands have on populations, on species. And I looked at the genetics and also the cra- what we call the cranial morphometric. So I basically mm-hmm. fired lasers at the skulls of these monkeys that are killed as, as pests out there to look for differences on a minute scale. So I always say it's, it's like comparing 100 pint glasses and you're looking for those minute differences between those glasses, those imperfections, those slight differences. So it was that level of, of uh, inspection and basically found out that they are well on their way to speciating into, into, a, new, into a new group um, in a very short period of time. So again, I was very much on that trajectory to, to go into, I keep sort of almost tongue in cheek, say real academia, but it was during that time that I started doing um, broadcasting and writing and it completely appealed to me this this sense of yes there are better people than me out there who are dedicated researchers who will be much better researchers who are more suited to that way of life whereas for me it was the opportunity to engage with kids and engage with the public and engage with a whole range of different audiences Mm -hmm. who are still just as as deserving to be part of that scientific exploration that scientific conversation 
Um, science is something that affects every single one of us, whether you think it does or not. And the more of us that realize that outside the scientific community, the better, really. So that's it, really. And I, yeah, the last several years, I, I still I still teach my students at university. However, I also write books. I do TV. I do radio. I, I do podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you're a man that wears many, many hats. Absolutely. Um, I mean, it's been, it's just been the most eclectic and fascinating journey that you've had. But I do want to touch on something that you have kind of just summarized there at the end and, and just go into that a little bit more because you've kind of referred to, quote, real academia or, quote, real science. And I just wonder, you know, have you felt those pressures as somebody who's kind of moved through a very non conventional route into science? You know, those pressures that you, aren't potentially perceived as a quote real science science scientist sorry um, and, and how then do you go on to perpetuate kind of accessibility and make science relatable to the non-scientists through the work that you do um yeah that's ooh, it's a really interesting area to think about mm. and it's quite a loaded area as well um which mm. i'm very happy to talk about but it's it's been difficult in many ways uh, and i say that as as a white guy from a relatively good background mm -hmm. um it's been difficult for me so i'm i'm very consciously aware how difficult getting into science can be for for any other group any other person any other individual um and i hope that in mm -hmm. some way if 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 i can help shout about that and i can sort of bring that to the the, the foreground then it'll it'll as you say increase accessibility for, for others as well hopefully but it's not been easy um and i say yeah. real academia and serious academics with a complete sense of tongue in cheek because i think <laughs> it's all rubbish i really do anyone who looks down on anyone for doing something slightly differently themselves i don't think they get it and i think they're the ones in the wrong i think it should be the more the merrier, the more diverse we are in terms of the people who make up science, the sort of science we do, and the areas in which we inhabit, um, it's the better. It's like, and again, ironically, it's like looking at nature and saying you've only got crocodiles in a riverine mm -hmm. system. It would be bonkers. You have to have the fish, you have to have the shellfish, you have to have the plants, you have to have everything there. If you have just one type of something, it's an imbalanced ecosystem. So you, why wouldn't you yeah. have that within our scientists, scientists as well? I think, yeah, by having a whole range of different people who increase accessibility, who focus on different areas in different manners, I think it, it makes it much more accessible. And we've seen this across the pandemic the last few years now, where suddenly science isn't just for scientists. And I say suddenly, it's never been just for scientists, but this sense of, oh my God, I need to understand science has really been thrown to the foreground for everyone suddenly. And we need people to onboard, we need people to engage, we need to have those conversations between scientists and non-scientists suddenly there's this sense of oh my god what do we do we have to talk to non-scientists now and it's it's some of us are going yes of course you've always had to do that it's only now you just realize so i think the more of us who can do this the better and actually the problems we're facing are more interdisciplinary they're, they're more uh, peripheral in many ways so if the problems encompass different aspects then surely the solution needs to encompass different areas of expertise, different personalities, different backgrounds. And that's not just someone who teaches um, slightly differently or who, who has an en engages a different audience. It's like I said, it's, it's everyone from the, the, the demographics that make up the scientific community right through to the work that each of us does. It should reflect the problems. It should reflect the audiences. So yeah, it's not been easy. And I've had, and I've had it at every level, actually. And this is not a woe is me story, but it just shows the problem in many ways from from PhD students who thought it was quaint, again, inverted commas, um, that I, I study something that was out of date <laughs> because I looked, at a, I looked at whole organisms. There was even a sense of, oh, you're not quite the real scientist because you're looking at a whole organism rather than just one tiny aspect, which is such a ridiculous idea. Right through to, not where I currently am, but in, in, in previous roles where even colleagues haven't been very accepting because it's, it's perceived as an easier route or it's not perceived as the, the, the done thing. And I think if you've spent years slogging your guts out and doing things to get where you are and then some, someone comes in a different way, I think it's, it's very often difficult for people to grasp that. And I yeah. think we need to be more, yeah. we need to be more open-minded. We need to be more accepting. Um, and we're starting to see change, but not enough. But I, I hope that that for each of us who are kicking off and banging the drum, who are able to at least, it makes mm. it easier for it makes it easier for science to reflect the people it should do. Really, 
Yeah, and, and, and conversations like these will help to, you know, assure those people who might be on the peripheries that actually there is space for them and, and there, you know, there's value in what they're doing and their contributions and, you know, it, it's open to them. Um, it's interesting because you talked about all of the aspects of, of being a scientist or, or a real scientist, as, as you put it. And I also wonder how you then go ahead and let your students know that science is not just made up from facts and figures. It's not just data. It's, it's intersectional. It, it, it contains art. It contains history. It contains so many other kind of multifaceted elements to the topic. How do you go forward and then teach your students that it's not just data? Um, that's a really difficult one to tackle to start with, as you say. And mm-hmm. I think part of that is, again, it's easier from the situation that I have. I'm, I'm now a senior academic. And again, white male background I'm not going to uh, be apologetic about that but mm-hmm. equally I can use that platform to say look this is what we should be doing it's yeah. much harder for for someone else potentially from a different uh coming from a different perspective to, to do this I can have the confidence that those those uh attributes give me um by being a mm-hmm. bit more playful in my approach by being a little bit more left field um and getting them to think about the bigger picture so for one example I guess my first year is at, um, at the UEA, and I, lo- I love teaching there. We, we have so many opportunities, and they're such great students. <laughs> but the very first years, um, they come in, and I don't think they necessarily um, get the most rigorous background in science always at school and at college. And, and, and that's fair enough. I think they're very often teaching to a curriculum that, that forgets some of the the fundamentals very often. So okay. uh, when I turned up, we had a very uh, very good set of, of practicals. However, I realized straight away that we were still missing some of the sort of basics and the f- sort of, uh, foundation blocks there. So our first practical now with me is we just look at 10 challenges to evolution. Things like, if we evolve from monkeys, how come there's still monkeys? Which is something I get asked about a million times a week on on. <laughs> On, on social media as a challenge but it's those it's those silly challenges yeah. it's those genuine but often silly but often flawed challenges to evolution to biology yeah. and we almost role play it so we get some postdocs mm-hmm. and some phd students in to act as the uh, the aggressor or as the as the the antagonist oh, and the students it. love it and it's really challenging their perception it's really challenging and and making them think about their ability to argue science but also to back it up with mm. with uh with with facts and figures but also still have that sort of, as you said that intersectional playing field to, to really engage with it and i think the more we can do of that as well helps them become better scientists so it's it's trial and error it's leading by example uh, and even the lectures that i give the, a lot of the examples are uh, probably non-traditional in some <laughs> respects, but um, it kind of works. I've got I've got very good students. I'm happy with their with their outcome. Oh, good. I think it definitely helps to have a lecturer that's bringing you uh, the opportunity to tap into other interests. So, for example, there'll be students that might be shy to the idea of of uh, you know copious amounts of data, but they're very comfortable with something like theatre or something like mm. storytelling, as we talked about earlier in the um, in the conversation. There's something we're going to get into in a minute, but you're able to kind of bring different elements to the table and that will resonate with different students and they'll be able to you know show their best and most authentic sides but talking about storytelling that kind of moves me on to how then you've gone on to bring storytelling back to the people and I I know that that's been a big motive behind your work as an author another one of your many many hats so I'd love to give you the opportunity to tell me a little bit about the books that you've written I know that they're for children is that correct they are yeah so i kind of realized a couple of years ago that there is such a wide sort of plethora of opportunities for you and me as adults if we're engaged and interested in popular science and sort of non-heavy text um, from an academic perspective there are so many opportunities out there from so many good authors I mean you could just list thousands of them right now without even thinking Um, and yet there's very few opportunities for younger readers it's there's some traditional publishers very large weighty tomes that ah, you'd need like a a rucksack just to carry one of them (laughs) around and they're very expensive and I thought we're missing there's a gap in the market here for kids who are very inquiring 
and want to engage, but they don't want to do it in a textbook format. And equally, they can't all afford these 30, 40 quid books either, which isn't fair on, on the reader or the parent trying to, mm. trying to inspire their kids here. So I kind of jumped into that little niche. Again, like nature, 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 ha- I always tell my students, nature hates a vacuum um, and always <laughs> trying to fill it. And I'm trying to do that same thing here, I guess, that there is an opportunity to engage kids in a fun and informal, yet very science heavy manner. Um, that hasn't really, I don't think, been done before. So I try and fill that niche. Now, my first series I did a few years ago was called So You Think You Know About Dinosaurs. And I asked a bunch of kids and it was mm-hmm. their six favorite species. And it was very much in the style of, I'd be very careful saying the horrible history style for, for copyright reasons, but it was very much in the, the horrible <laughs> history style, small, compact books that are affordable that you can stick in your pocket. Um, yeah. These are very science heavy. So these are university level um, mm-hmm. content for five, six, seven year olds. Um, and the kids pick their species. It's T-Rex and, and Stegosaurus and Triceratops. Mm-hmm. And it's deconstructing all that classic information but then on top of that, reanalyzing and saying, right, what is the newest science? What are the, the most recent concepts? Um, and it also introduced a lot of different academics as well. So a lot of my work, I'll try, whether it's TV, radio or books, try and show the cross-section of people within these different fields. So it was an opportunity to see other scientists as well. And they did really well. Um, and then at the start of the pandemic in 2020, I found myself with a bit of free time, as many of us did, um, <laughs> and decided to write another series called Extinct. Um, a lot of kids talk to me about extinctions, um, partly from a way that's um, driven by eco-anxiety, but also yeah. that childhood fascination with the, the morbid and macabre. Um, <laughs> this, did you know that everything died when the asteroid <laughs> struck? Like, yes, I did, little child. Um <laughs> But, I'll, but then I'll always throw it back and go, do you know how big the asteroids were? Do you know why it struck in a particular place that caused so much devastation and nowhere else? And do you know what happened afterwards? And it's this sense of, no, I don't. It's like, right, let's do a series of books looking at these mass extinctions that have almost set chapters in the history of life on Earth um, over the last half billion years or so. And each one chronicles a different stage in, in history or prehistory of our planet looking at these massive events, whether they're asteroids or huge lava fields or even sort of more <laughs> biologically driven extinctions. And each one looks at a character, say a character each time it's a species or, or group of species. It might be T-Rex. It might be Hallucigenia, this weird, wonderful worm-like organism that lived 360 million years ago, right through to Megalodon, the world's largest shark ever. So each one tells the story of the last days, weeks, months, or even years of some of these most iconic or weird um, characters, I keep saying, uh, in within the natural world. Um, and it's, again, it's always this concept of really heavy science. It is talking about pentadactyl limbs and, uh, and napsids and diapsids and synapsids for eight, nine, ten-year-olds. And you can do that if you explain what they are and you can show them in a format that's engaging, that's onboarding, that's fun and accessible. So it always makes me laugh when I see one of my students with one of my books aimed at kids <laughs> revising for something they shouldn't be. It's like, well, I'm pretty sure there are better textbooks out there. Like, and they'll often say, well, you've covered everything in this and it's nice. Yeah. Oh, okay, fine. It's, um, <laughs> I think if we fall into that trap of dumbing down science for our audience, we're doing it wrong so there's no reason that shouldn't be done for kids so yeah that's that's my whole driving factor behind my my, my work as an author for kids that's mm. what I think. yeah I'm um, absolutely fascinating I love that and it makes it it makes it pal- you know palatable if it's if it's heavy but it's something that they can pick up and put down quite easily it gives them the power it definitely gives them you know knowledge that they can take back you know to their parents and say oh did you know and then they'll give them a fact that they might have just literally bred rather than trying to use our imagination to create a scenario. Some children aren't capable um, of using their imagination in a kind of like, you know, fictitious way. So I think that's, mm. it, it's, it's really good that you're able to bring that in such a kind of dynamic and sort of punchy way. But you did touch on eco-anxiety. And I wonder if that's, I know you said that that's something that comes up. How do you uh, bring those challenging topics beyond uh, your books to empower children about responsibility for our planet going forward? I think it's a really hard level to get right. And I understand where some parents, caregivers, whoever, um, right through to teachers, 
don't feel they can engage in some of the really difficult topics. I mean, death is the classic one. It's really hard to engage kids with, with death. We, so we lost a chicken yesterday, sadly, and I live in a, a lovely, we've got a community garden, and some of the neighbours were really upset about the loss of this chicken. And as fair as that is, I do think a lot of that is because we don't really have a good relationship with the macabre, with the sad, with the, mm-hmm. the, 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 the death side of things. Um, and it manifests in weird ways. Um, that's a slight sideline there, but I think that's still really applicable to things like eco anxiety. We are talking, it's like literally, as you and I are talking today, El, that uh, I read this morning that at the moment in the Arctic, it's 30 degrees warmer than expected. Um, no, sorry, the, the Arctic is 40 degrees warmer than expected, and the Antarctic is 30 degrees warmer than expected. We're talking hugely different temperatures right now we're talking massive acceleration of climate change and the devastating impact of that and yet we expect to not tell kids about this or we expect to brush over it or tell them not to worry for me as a scientist who engages with kids a lot something that i hate is to this sort of dumbing down or this uh covering things over and and then oh it's too look sweetie it's too difficult for you to understand so i can't possibly tell you about it if we expect those kids not to go away and not think about that, then we're doing them a massive disservice. Um, so I think for me, that's a long-winded mm-hmm. answer of saying, I think, first of all, we need to identify that the kids are very conscious of this. And they have more of a voice uh, than ever before, I think. And people like Greta uh, are, are figureheads in that. But there are so many other young people around the world from different backgrounds who are who are really showing that young people are engaged and a powerful force. But I think the way that we engage that is to have these open and frank conversations with them, whether it's about death, whether it's about eco-anxiety, whether it's about climate change, in a way that doesn't absolutely scare the hell out of them. But equally, it um, it onboards them, it empowers them, it allows them to explore these topics that they're already thinking about in a way that's safe, but also giving them the 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 agency to have a say in this matter if uh, we're talking about those differences in temperature right now and it worries me as a senior academic i know it worries you assume presumably as well why would we assume it doesn't worry kids i mean they're the ones who are going to inherit this i think we have to give them a voice in all this not just a token gesture at school where they can do a picture about what the future might look like and it's as important as that is and that's not to detract from that but equally i think we need to be having the ability to, to engage with them. So yeah, I mean, it's you've got to make sure they feel safe and that you can almost bring them back to a place where they feel there is always hope. And I think there always has to be a sense of we can make a difference. And I, and I believe that. I think if I lost sense of that, then what what is the point um, of, of, of carrying on? So I think you've got to give young people, especially the sense of this is what we can do. Here's our hope. And, and Jane Goodall talks about reason for hope and, and this sense of you can achieve something and we can all make a difference. I still firmly believe that. Um, I think yeah. by having these conversations and linking kids up and allowing them to talk to academics, to politicians, to, to, to adults, to, to grown-ups in a way that we're not talking down at them with our hands on our knees, looking down at them and, and almost sort of patronising them unintentionally but treating them as another person with a stake in, in this in this future. I think that's really important for kids. And it can be as it can be much younger than we anticipate. And I've had some really lovely but serious conversations with, with kids, with their with their caregivers around, obviously, um, to make sure that they feel okay. But mm-hmm. there's some really interesting questions that they have. And very often it's this sense of they just want an answer. They don't want a solution necessarily. But I think this sense of mm-hmm. there's nothing worse sometimes than for inquiring minds than to shut it down without allowing them to address it because then they go away and then they try and find their own answers and if they don't have that that scope to know how to address some of these really big quite daunting topics it manifests in a way that's not constructive i think that's worse for me so i think yeah it's it's being quite open it's doing it in a safe environment they feel they can explore these things but we have to maintain there is a sense of you can do something here you can achieve something we can still make a difference and i think it's really important I think my final point on that is not this idea of, well, it's all up to you now, kiddo. I hate that narrative. It's like, well, we've made such a mess of the world as grown ups, so off you go, children. That's awful. That's a really, really crappy way of looking at this. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's I think that's really dangerous. It's not mm-hmm. their job to sort out our mistakes and our, our failings, um, but it's something they're involved with. And I think that's a, 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 a fine line to tread, really. Yeah. And I don't want to I don't want to sort of push too much on this point, but 
as somebody who is at the forefront of science communication and you do a lot and you make incredible concerted effort to bring about uh, outreach and inspiration around conservation but being somebody at the forefront you're much more steeped in the knowledge of what actually is going on you know if I can say you actually know the data so do you then find yourself struggling with that kind of eco-anxiety or any eco-related concerns because you're so invested in the knowledge of it? Yeah, <laughs> there's a very, very blunt answer to that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not naive, but mm-hmm. I think there's a difference between, I mean, I've got colleagues and friends and I've met people in the past before who have lost the sense of hope. And I think as a conservationist, especially mm-hmm. if you lose your sense of hope, then step away and, and do something different that makes you happy, that keeps you happy. Mm-hmm. And we only have so much energy, I think. Um, and it's not a problem if you lose that that sense of, of, of optimism. And it's not like Disney where everything's wonderful, let's skip down the road. It's not a naive optimism, but I think we have to see the wins where they are. And I think we have to see the, the achievements that are attainable. Um, and I think that keeps me going. There's that small scale. So I work with a lot of different charities. One, of, for example, is the uh, the Norfolk Wildlife Trust, um, which is a part of this sort of 46, 47 trusts around the UK. Uh, another one is uh, the Youth STEM Awards. So it's science, technology, engineering, maths and medicine, which engages kids and onboards them in a slightly nerdier version than the Duke of Edinburgh Awards. Um, <laughs> by seeing these achievements that these groups do on often a small scale, but tangible uh, scale as well really keeps me going and I think as long as I'm optimistic and I'm positive and I'm aware that we can still achieve things that's enough for me and yeah it's it's this constant battle of god things are depressing but um but what if we don't I mean, it's worse if we don't do anything um just because something's hard and something seems insurmountable it doesn't mean we we can't keep pushing for it and that's that's right across the board whether it's sporting achievements right through to trying to save an environment it's things often aren't very easy but it doesn't mean we shouldn't try them and it's not for everyone i fully get that not everyone is equipped to deal with these things and not everyone is in the right mind space or not everyone has the right capabilities to do this and that's okay as well that's not a problem we can't all try and save the world and we can't all try and win olympic gold and and that's okay as well that's fine you shouldn't ever feel guilty that you're not doing enough if you're trying, if you're not trying and you're not doing anything, you're actively, actively aiding the degradation of the world around you, then fine, feel as guilty as you should do. However, I, I would hate anyone to be sitting there thinking, God, I just don't do enough. I hear this a lot, but oh, I'm vegan and, and I walk to work and I do this and I don't do this. And I don't fly and see my friends and family and I don't have any pets. I still feel like I'm not doing enough. It's like, mm. geez, just stop. Enjoy yourself and actually do what you can. If all of us did a little bit, it would make a difference. One person doesn't have to do everything. Um, and I think that's it for me. So it's, it's that constant battle, as you're right, is I could do more, we could do more, things are pretty bad. Um, and very often it's that classic stuff, isn't it? It's the people who could make the biggest differences, governments and, and huge corporations aren't mm-hmm. to the level, and that's not me being political, they're, they're just not, they're, they're not doing enough. Um, And we get sidetracked, and of course we do, by the terrible things going on, such as wars right now um, and and economic uh, downturns. Of course, that's all understandable, that that this big looming specter that's hiding in the... Well, it's not hiding, it's sort of looming behind us that's going to have an impact for thousands of years suddenly doesn't seem quite as relevant as this thing that's going on today. And I understand that, but equally, it's we have to give it a lot more more focus than we currently are, because if we ignore this, then it's a game-changer. Yeah. Well, I think the storytelling and the education will lead to the inspiration. And and like you say, it will get more people involved, more people caring, and then small change on a bigger on a bigger scale, which will actually lead to, you know, a change in policy. If more people know who to vote for, then again, without being too political, you know, if they, if they don't know who to vote for because they don't have the knowledge, because it's not accessible, then how can we make a change? So, yeah, I think the storytelling is super important. Absolutely. And even things like this sense of I'm just one person or I'm just one kid. I hate that narrative as well. That it's, well, if China's already doing this or the British government are doing that, well, who am I? You're, you're a person. You are, you make a difference. Yeah. And Jane Goodall was, mm-hmm. was like this for me. She grew up as a little girl who was fascinated by the chickens on a, on a family visit um, to, a, to another family sort of friend's uh, area. 
and she watched chickens inside their coop and she watched a hen laying an egg. And that one experience really helped galvanize her love for the world around her and that sense of inquiring about nature and, and different species. And look what she's done since. There's, there's literally any given time a million young people around the world at least involved in projects that she's doing. She's worked in numerous countries. She's helped save uh, huge amounts of, of sub-Saharan African um, habitat. That's one person. Mandela was one person. Desmond Tutu was one person. Mm. Individual people change the world for the better. Um, I think it's really important for us to remind ourselves of that, but, but definitely kids of that as well. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I think... You know your contributions, Ben. <laughs> You're definitely doing some some world changing and some and some perception shifting. And I'd love to give you the opportunity to talk to me a little bit about what your future looks like. I don't know what your day to day is. I think you said you're a professor. Tell me where you're at and what's what's to come. Oh, um, oh, I don't know. Every day is different, <laughs> and it's one. And I love that. I mean, I, I think I get bored very quickly. I've realised I, I don't mind being bored, but I do get very bored with routine. I don't like routine. So as much as possible. Every day is different for me. So today, for example, I'm planning a whole new book for young readers. I can't tell you what it is yet, but it's really exciting. Like really, really exciting. So I'm very excited to be doing this. This is something that I've wanted to do since I was a kid. Um, yeah. And I'm finally at that level where I can, I can write that book now, um, which is very cool. Um, I am also working on a couple of different TV ideas, again, which they're all embargoed. I can't tell you about them. Um, <laughs> But I think that for me, the central thread is I've got lots of projects on the go that I'm constantly developing ideas. And each of those hopefully will showcase different areas of science. But more importantly for me often is showcasing the people involved in the science, the processes that go on with, with the science to, again, to, to make people feel more conversant, more confident, more able to, to engage with, with science. Um, mm -hmm. An average day, I don't have an average day, and I, and I really like that. I don't <laughs> like, I don't like that routine at all. And in terms of where I'll be in five years, I, you know, I, I've never wanted to know that, and I don't want to know. I think the moment for me, at least, that I feel comfortable enough to be able to say I'll be doing this in five years' time. Oh, that would that just oh, that's me. I'm, yeah. I'm scratching my arms at the thought of that. That's just <laughs> that really does. That just I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable. <laughs> as much as we want to know, as much as all of us listening will want to know what you're up to in the next five years, we will watch and wait with bated breath Absolutely. with excitement to see what. You're... <laughs> oh, Ben, it's been such a pleasure. Before you go, I tend to do this as a sort of new thing that I'm doing on this mm -hmm. podcast, and um, it's a little quick five question rapid fire. Would you be up for it? Absolutely. Okay, so the reason I'm doing this is because in our conversation, it's normally quite sort of formal, but this always gives you, as the listener, a little bit of a taste of the, the person outside of their kind of professional reading. So, uh -oh. <laughs> okay, first of all, it doesn't have to be one word answers. It can be as long as you like. Number one, if you could bring back an extinct species. Oh, no. What would be <laughs> Rapid fire for a reason. No, <laughs> don't think, don't, don't even think. No, I already know. No, I know what it is. It's the thylacine, this wonderful yes. animal yes. that was was sadly killed by by us in the early twentieth century mm -hmm. in the nineteen thirties. The last one was called Benjamin. Uh, mm -hmm. He froze to death at being left outside. Um, there was a bounty on the heads. They were these vicious, terrible killers of livestock and and dreams and children and whatever. You, everything was blamed at poor thylacines. And they were a little bit larger than the fox, small than the wolf. They ate small marsupials. They were a persecuted species. However, I wouldn't bring them back because... <laughs> Because the issue right now is people are trying to bring them back. They want to genetically yeah. modify things and they're going to spend millions of pounds and blah, 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 blah. And it's great yeah. as a theoretical concept. However, there are enough species that are in desperate need of help right now without bringing things back that we've already screwed up the first time around. So I would love to see thylacines still here. I probably wouldn't bring them back in the current situation, <laughs> spending millions of pounds into an unsafe world. That's how I know you're a scientist because you've given an like the the, the weighted answer with both sides to justify. <laughs> then it's a rapid fire. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> theoretical. I should have stated that it's theoretical. Fine. T Rex. T Rex. N L. T Rex. No, no. We haven't done that. Seen everyone knows a scientist. Okay. Right. Number two. Um, what is your favorite living species? Oh, chimpanzees. Of course, knew you were going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, okay, which leads me on to another. Oh, go on, go on. A close second, those humpback whales. Um, they are my. They're, they're my. I don't know why. They are a beautiful, wonderful species. And I think if I came back as something, <laughs> it would be a hump. I don't know why. I don't know why I'm telling you now. It would be a humpback whale. But my favorite species is <laughs> a chimp. Second favorite is is a humpback. 
<laughs> I told you you get the kind of the personal <laughs> bit about it, the guest. <laughs> but it's funny because you're, you're, you know, preaching to the choir. So um, most people think that birds are my favourite animal. And not that this podcast is about me, but actually whales are my favourite really? animals. So, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy with that. Brilliant. Answer. Okay. Favourite place on earth? Oh, uh, Norfolk. Um, I, I still love going home. My beach, and I say my beach, changes every time I go walk with my dad, my mum, my dog, or their dog. Um, and I love that sense of this is my beach that has been since I was a kid, and yet it's so familiar and it's so alien on a daily, hourly basis. Mm -hmm. That means so much to me, and I can't imagine not having my beach. Um, mm -hmm. However, other than that, would be northwest Uganda, where I spent a lot of time living in the jungle. Oh, and I feel like we barely scratch the surface on some of your work abroad. So I'll have to have you back in a few years and, and get more from you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and last few questions, and I promise I'll let you okay. go. And um, then, what do you do to de stress? Run. Okay. Do you just feel like it clears your mind? That wasn't one of the questions. Uh, no, oh. actually, it doesn't clear my mind. It, cla it, it helps me focus my mind. It's like meditation. Meditation oh. isn't yeah. about um, clearing your mind and going blank and sitting there going mm. om for an hour. It's, it's, yeah, <laughs> I, know, I know you know that, but it's, it's that misconception. <laughs> but running's the same for me. Running allows me to work through problems. It allows me to, to think about stuff. If I'm, so I went for a run, well, I went for two runs yesterday. Um, and in both of those, I was planning this new book. And it's a really lovely way of right. I've got a couple of hours to just really plan the concepts, the title, the, the, the different chapters. And for me, it's, it's, it's laser focused. And at the same time, jumping over puddles and avoiding dog poo and uh, <laughs> listening to birds. <laughs> Well, that kind of, it, it gives you time back. Yeah. It, you, it's almost like reserved time for you to, to think. You're not sleeping, you're not eating, you're not working. You're, it's time for you. Yeah. I can totally see that. Okay, your final question for this um, podcast is, what is your favourite quality in yourself? Oh, wow, you finish on a killer there. Um, <laughs> I've heard that before. <laughs> uh, favourite quality in myself? I think not being too serious. I think mm -hmm. it's such a serious world around us and there are so many serious things going on. I just don't like being too serious. And I, I hope I never lose that sense of being silly and a bit playful and a bit uh, mm -hmm. tongue in cheek with everything. And, and maybe it's not always appropriate, but I, I just feel like I just don't really want to be too mature and too grown up yet. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think that's part of your charm and it's been an absolute pleasure listening to you be so curiosity led. And I think that taps into your you know, best quality, your, your playful curiosity led and you're asking all the questions we all want the answers to. Ben, thank you so much for being on my podcast. Thank you for having me on. It's been really good fun. So that concludes my conversation with Professor Ben Garrard, scientist, broadcaster, author, professor of evolutionary biology and science communicator. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Ben. And if you would like to find him, his social media platforms are Ben underscore Garrard on Twitter and Instagram. And his website is bengarrard.co.uk. If you would like to find the podcast, we're at Specimens Pod on Twitter and Instagram. And if you would like to find me, it's at LK Taxidermy on Instagram. If you are listening on Apple iTunes, feel free to leave us a rating or review. It really helps to get the show seen by others. And I will be truly grateful. Thank you so much for listening. And I'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Take care of yourselves. Speak to you soon.